Mr. Johnston. Kurt, I couldn't agree more. I think the changes that have been unveiled, both in Japan and at the 2 plus 2, sort of point to an alliance agenda that's one of integration. Really in a way that hasn't been true before. And that will demand new things of the United States as well. So I think that's a point that's very well taken. Maybe just turning to a slightly different subject, and that's the G7 and the Prime Minister's preparation for his leadership year. I wonder, what message did the Prime Minister have for the President on his G7 agenda, and in particular on this, on the Prime Minister's very personally strongly held views on nuclear issues? What sort of message did he bring with him? And what did he seek the president's support for in terms of the G7 agenda this year? Ambassador Tomita, as I said at the outset, this visit to Washington was the last leg of his trip to Europe and North America. So I think G7 how to coordinate members' position on various issues was very, the main theme of this trip this time. And as far as G7 is concerned, we have to go through all these preparatory processes. The political directors are going to work on many fronts. But basically, I think there are two things that will come out of this summit in May. The one is the G7 members' unwavering commitment to rule of law. I think that's, of course, includes Ukraine, but also I think the leaders are going to address any other unilateral attempt to change the status quo that might happen anywhere else. So rule of law, I think, is one of the main themes of the meeting. The other theme will be engagement with the global south. And I think this will be reflected, G7 countries reaching out to the, all these in the global south. At the same time, the members are trying to bring tangible benefits to the global south to give leadership in tackling the various global issues, like climate change, food, energy crisis, and so on and so forth. So rule of law and engagement with the global south will be the two main themes of the summit. And, of course, the significance of the prime minister choosing Hiroshima as a venue cannot be understated. I mean, he has a very strong commitment to the cause of creating a world free from nuclear weapons. But at the same time, his ideal is also grounded on realism. So I think he's looking forward to practical discussions, trying to chart out the path to this world, while being mindful of the current, the challenges. For instance, posed by Russia, for instance. So I think the nuclear issue will be a very important part of the discussions in Hiroshima. Mr. Campbell, I'll just jump in a second on this. I very much like Ambassador Tomita's answer. I would simply say, just for context, we have a lot of different meetings. Obviously, the United States will be hosting APEC later this year. There are meetings in the G20. These are all important institutions. But because of, as the ambassador indicated, what's happened with Russia and some other challenges. Some of these larger institutions are harder to operate in right now. And one of the benefits of the G7 is that you've got a group of like-minded states that really can combine forces on shared challenges. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're so excited to be going to Japan for the G7. And I will say, as Ambassador Tomita indicated, the Prime Minister took a careful opportunity to brief the President on his goals and objectives for the G7. And the President welcomed the program in Hiroshima. We're looking forward to that. I think it's very important. It has enormous historical resonance and significance. We accept that, and we understand it. It is also the case that in addition to the issues that the Prime Minister, that Ambassador Tomita indicated the Prime Minister raised, he also said it was going to be important to remind the G7 not to flag in Ukraine. And I think that will be a continuing issue that will be pointed out. And also, he did indicate to the President, as a representative from the Indo-Pacific, he intended to make the argument. The case of the significance and the important focus of other countries in Europe and elsewhere on the dynamic region that is the Indo-Pacific. And I think that's something that we welcome.
and again, as you've heard, Chris, in a number of venues. We've sought to build those links between the transatlantic and the transpacific communities to focus on common challenges and to embrace common opportunities as well. Mr. Johnston. Yeah, that's great. I was going to ask you next sort of what the discussion between the two leaders was one, was on Ukraine. And you've sort of addressed that. Did the president have a specific ask of Prime Minister Kashida, Kurt, with respect to support? Mr. Campbell. Look, Chris, I got to tell you what is changing now in the relationship. Like, in the past often was sometimes. One would have to say, please. And Prime Minister Kashida has a game plan and is already engaged deeply on issues in Ukraine, and had engaged deeply with European countries about the plans they had. And so I fully expect that, at appropriate time, Japan will be rolling out specific plans to support Ukraine in a variety of ways. They are active in many of the contact group discussions about support for Ukraine. And they're just a key member. I don't think we're in an environment any longer where the United States has to ask or cajole Japan. Japan is stepping up, following its own course. And we're just grateful that that course runs so closely to ours. Mr. Johnston. Yeah, very much agree with that. The Prime Minister said in his speech, and I had been saying for some time as well, that really Japan led Asia in the response to Ukraine, to ensure that the response to the invasion was a global one and not simply a regional one. That's all. Thank you for watching. Mr. Campbell. Look, Chris, I got to tell you what is changing now in the relationship. Like, in the past often was sometimes. One would have to say, please. And Prime Minister Kashida has a game plan and is already engaged deeply on issues in Ukraine, and had engaged deeply with European countries about the plans they had. And so I fully expect that, at appropriate time, Japan will be rolling out specific plans to support Ukraine in a variety of ways. They are active in many of the contact group discussions about support for Ukraine. And they're just a key member. I don't think we're in an environment any longer where the United States has to ask or cajole Japan. Japan is stepping up, following its own course. And we're just grateful that that course runs so closely to ours. Mr. Johnston. Yeah, very much agree with that. The Prime Minister said in his speech, and I had been saying for some time as well, that really Japan led Asia in the response to Ukraine, to ensure that the response to the invasion was a global one and not simply a regional one. That's all. For more details and assurance, please read the original. Thank you for watching.